The school itself is a K-12 uh, day boy and boarding school. It's located on the Upper North Shore at Warunga. We have more than 2,300 students at the school from K-12. to And when you include the number of teaching staff and administrations, administration staff and property and so forth, we're probably looking at an organisation of around 3,000 people. And we are a uniting church school. Over the last four years, we have undergone significant transformation. The, this transformation started with one simple question from the headmaster. And the headmaster said to me, what is pastoral care? And I went running to our policy to try and give him an uh, explanation on what pastoral care is all about. And he told me to tear up the policy because he said he can go to any website, as you can now, to access a school's pastoral care document. And all it is is paper. And that, was, that started our journey, that one simple question. So it was like a niche. When you get a niche, you can either scratch it or you can ignore it or you can actually look at it and get the best treatment possible for that itch. And that's what it was. We had this itch back in 2009 that we were not quite where we wanted to be. We are, in an, we are an independent boys' school. We are in a very competitive market. Parents are very savvy when it comes to selection of education for their children, um, in this case for boys. So what differentiated Knox from other boys' schools? We, we have Shaw, Barker, Kings, Riverview very close to us, so it is a very competitive market. But more importantly, what were we doing for our boys, boys in the 21st century? Our policy document was written probably decades ago on pastoral care, yet we are dealing with a different landscape. If we look at what adolescents are dealing with now, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's completely different to what you and I were dealing with when we were back at school. Just look at the social, the social media and the landscape that they're dealing with and the, the information that's presented in the media and what they're confronted with now. So that was a really tough question. And that started the journey. We had a couple, so we, we did an inventory on the school and we had some things in our favour. We are a school that is 90 years old, so we have traditions that we celebrate each year. And that's important for any organisation to be able to celebrate as a community. So we had that in our favour. The other thing that we had is strong values within the school. And we didn't, whatever we wanted to do, and we were not quite sure, but whatever we were going to do, we did not want to deviate from those values. And that's one bit of advice I'd give any organisation. For a school in particular, parents were selecting Knox for a particular reason. Our values of faith, integrity, compassion, wisdom, that's why they wanted to come to Knox. They liked the traditions, they liked the cadet unit, and so on. So they're the things that we had to hold dear, and they're the things that were, as Susie would say, WWW, what's working well. But in regards to the itch, we felt that the students were not quite settled. We felt that staff, faculties, departments within any organisation were working in silos. Was that sense of collaboration happening within the school? Was there engagement with teachers to teachers, teachers to students, students to students, and also teachers to the wider community? And what about our HSC results? Were they where we wanted them to be? Whether we like it or not, schools are judged by their HSC results. It's pretty sad, isn't it, that we consider our students as standardised test scores. Well, they're not. They're more than that. Yes, we have the, um, the dreaded league tables that come out in January and... Is this still on? You could, sorry. The dreaded league tables that come out in January and they rate schools. How terrible is that? It's unbelievable. So we're rating kids on standardised test scores. We go into the classroom and we have a prescribed syllabus document where, quick, get in, get your books out, sit down, let's get started. What a way to start the day. You know, it's tough enough getting to going to maths, period one, but to have your teacher say, sit down, let's get started, we've got stuff to get through. Now, we have no idea what this poor boy was dealing with before 8.30 when he walked through the front doors. Mum and Dad, who are working extremely hard to send them to a, a school that costs a lot of money, are out the doors by six and seven, working full time. The son's getting up, looking after his little sister or little brother, making his own lunch, getting on public transport. Has he got his laptop? Has he got his boater? Has he got his books? He's got me on the front gate saying, tuck your shirt in, pull your socks up, and then gets to the maths class and say, sit down, hurry up, let's get started. 
not a really good way to engage with boys. We wondered why there wasn't that connection. So that started the journey, that was the itch. Um, funny enough, it does happen in schools. We are bound by a, a syllabus document. So we thought, okay, what can we do? Pastoral care, what is it about? What, what is it about pastoral care that can really meet the needs of our boys in the 21st century? And thankfully, we stumbled across Susie. And we went down to Melbourne in 2010 and Susie was presenting. And it's from that day at a workshop down at Monash University. And it was from that day that a wonderful relationship started. We knew what we kind of wanted to do, but we didn't know how to go about it. We knew that there needed to be change, deep embedded change within the culture of the school. But how do we do that? And how do we make it sustainable? So that's when Susie came on board and that's when the relationship started and that's when the rubber really hit the road and we started to, to make advancements. So we thought, well, how can we make change sustainable and embedded in the culture of the school? And the question was easy. Our best asset, which is teachers, our staff. It starts with staff. And we were looking at it the wrong way. Well, I certainly was. I was focusing on the boys. What can we do to engage the boys? What can we do to really get this sense of life skills? I mean, when you read an article where the head of HSBC over in London talks about, he was interviewed by Alan November, what is the greatest skill you look for in your future employees? And we're expecting something like, you know, driven or, you know, extremely motivated, intrinsically driven or something like that. He turns around and says, empathy. I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful. So these life skills, do we teach our adolescents empathy and tolerance and understanding and respect for other people's points of views? What about staff? We've got staff that are running from A to B to C to D, getting from classroom to classroom. We've got pressures of HSC results. We've got pressures of parents, parent-teacher night marking. And you can shape the, what I'm saying now into your own context, into your own organisation. The principles are the same. So what about teacher well-being. If we can get the teachers to a point where we are working in a community that is thriving and flourishing and productive and engaged, then that we are going to have overflows to all areas of the school, especially the classroom and especially the core business, which is our boys. So how do we do that? Well, we looked at three processes, engagement, empowerment and trust. So we started with step one, engaging our staff, and Susie came on board and we spoke about baseline measurements because we wanted everything that we're going to do to be scientifically evaluated and measured. Because importantly, any form of intervention that we started, we could actually make sure it was measurable so we could see whether it was effective. And that, hence the importance of baseline data. And the first stage of engagement was so powerful. The AI interviews that Susie mentioned gave staff a voice and they were open and they were honest and they felt listened to and it was amazing. From that led to empowerment. So the main theme that was coming through with staff is we want to be better connected with the boys but we want to be better connected with each other as colleagues. So they were able to identify that. Before we can connect with the boys we need to connect with each other. We need to have this shared vision. And the school had a vision, you know, we knew where we wanted to go, we had a capital um, uh, works project and we had bricks and mortar and we had all this stuff that was going on. We had uh, we're financially we're in a very good position but schools and organisations are about relationships so what can we do beyond the bricks and mortar? The empowerment, they were telling us that they want training and they want time to be with the boys and to be with each other. Let's get away from working in silos. Give us the opportunity to collaborate with one another. So all this rich information was coming through Susie, feeding back to us as the executive. Then the principles or the foundation or the journey of positive psychology commenced and Susie was instrumental in guiding the school through that process delivering the foundations, the philosophy of what positive psychology, positive education is about and putting it in context for Knox. Not putting it in context for other schools, you may have heard Geelong Grammar or St Peter's or other schools. What works for Knox? What is our culture? What do we do well? And how can we shape POS Ed 
for Knox, and that was really important from the outset. So we started the training in positive psychology and life coaching, and it was a three-day course, and it was voluntary. And the first course, we opened it up to staff. And I was on that first course, and I sent out an email, and we knew where we were going because we had fed information because Susie mentioned the team of champions or the positive education team. And there, there were 16 on that team, and we were, started to filter the information. We started to go out to staff and have little sub-meetings, and it was the same message that was being delivered to the staff. So again, that engagement with staff was paramount. 